Well, hello everyone and welcome to this sixth installment of the new National Climate Assessment Roundtable Series. My name is Larry Perez and I'm part of the Climate Change Response Program for the National Park Service. And I wanna let you know right off the bat that today's roundtable is being live captioned with the kind assistance of Fed Relay. So if you'd like to take advantage of that caption, just use the link that we'll be sharing momentarily in the chat box. This particular roundtable series is intended to really deliver area-specific information to units of the national park system within each of the 10 national climate assessment regions. The roundtables are opportunities to really learn about the latest findings from the 2018 assessment and to ask relevant questions of subject matter experts and have a dialogue with NPS leaders that are actively working on climate change issues in their parks. And we really highly encourage your participation in this forum and asking your questions that might be foremost on your mind. Today's roundtable will focus squarely on the parks within the Southern Great Plains region of the assessment. So if you happen to be calling in from a park outside this area, that's okay. We still very much welcome your participation. Subsequent installments are gonna focus on additional regions throughout the year. And recordings of the previous events we've held so far this year and a full schedule of upcoming roundtables can all be found using the link that we're gonna post into the chat box at this time. As part of today's call, we're gonna be hearing very shortly from Dr. Kevin Clays on findings, impacts, and actions from the fourth National Climate Assessment, followed by an open question and answer session. We'll also have an open panel discussion featuring several invited guests from parks in the Southern Great Plains region, and we'll follow that with a second open question and answer session as well. We're hoping to conclude this promptly at 2.30 Central Time today. I'm gonna to be one of two facilitators on today's round table, so I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Matt Holly will be helping us manage our technology today. And speaking of that technology, let's take a second to share a few words about it before we begin. All of the functionality of the webinar interface is accessed through this tiny toolbar. If the panels aren't already visible on the toolbar, you can access them by clicking on the little arrow uh, at the top of the toolbar. Be aware that your panels might minimize periodically by default, but you can set them to remain open by clicking on view along the top of the menu and deselecting the auto hide option that you find there. The radio buttons in your audio panel are gonna show you how you're currently connected to the webinar. For best audio quality, we highly recommend that you dial in via phone rather than using your computer audio. If you're currently connected via computer audio, you're welcome to switch over to phone audio at this time by just selecting the phone radio button and dialing in. We do have quite a few participants on the line with us today, so all participants are muted uh, just by default to keep background noise in check. We will, however, have a couple of dedicated Q&A periods during this roundtable. Again, these roundtables are truly golden opportunities to ask questions of our invited experts and practitioners relative to your park unit and the challenges that you are facing. So we really welcome you to bring your voice into the room, and there are two ways to do that today. If you have a question you'd like to ask during our Q&A session, simply find the raise your hand icon that's on the webinar interface and we'll unmute you one by one to ask your questions. And just so everyone gets familiar with that functionality, I'd like to ask everyone that can hear my voice to raise your hand if you like ice cream. Larry, we are seeing some hands being raised. I would say they're coming up slowly. And some people are putting theirs down. We have some indecisive people today. They can't decide if they're an ice cream or a cake person. <laughs> well, I have some kindred spirits out there and some that are indecisive, uh, but you figured out the toggle feature of the hand icon. You can raise and your, lower your hand as you see fit. So do use that if you wanna voice any questions. And Matt, I'll ask you to go ahead and clear them all right now. You can ask those questions verbally during the Q&A session, but you're also welcome to submit questions at any point in time during this broadcast. To do so, just enter your text into the questions panel, as you see here. Matt and I are gonna monitor for incoming questions and pose them to our speakers and panelists at the very first appropriate opportunity that we have. And additionally, should you have any difficulty with the technology today, this questions panel is the place to let Matt and I know so we can help you out. Finally, be aware that this live session is being recorded for future reference and sharing online. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. I would very much like to take a moment to invite Kat Hawkins Hoffman, Chief of the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program to say a few words to kick off the round table. Kat? Yeah, thank you, Larry. Um, 
I just have a, about three things I want to say first is to thank the team from the climate change program who was orchestrating this. So that is Matt and Dave facilitating the panel. And um, just to let you guys know, Larry has gone to heroic measures to overcome challenges in technology to make this work. Larry and I are both out of the office at a at a workshop. So he's sitting in a hotel room with tables running here and there. and. <laughs> He's had to go to quite a lot to make this work and it's pretty seamless, so uh, highly appreciated, Larry. And then uh, just to say it's always a privilege to hear from authors of the National Climate Assessment chapters. So I really do appreciate um, having Kevin on board and um, especially those who are going to speak on the panel about how to use this information, showing awareness, of the challenge of climate change, how they're thinking about it and responding to it. So just a hearty thanks to our speakers, Kevin, Michael, Mark, and Don. And lastly, for those who are listening, I really want to encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to ask any questions that you've ever had about climate change, about what is in the National Climate Assessment, about the climate futures anything. Um, we have set this up intentionally to be informal and no question is crazy. So I really do encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to submit questions. Don't wait till the end. We have found in the series that we're running that frequently the viewers of the webinar, we, we get bombed with a lot of questions at the very end when we're beginning to run out of time. So it demonstrates there's a lot of interest, but don't hold back. Um, highly encourage you to submit your questions. Okay, Larry. Thanks very much, Kat. Appreciate it. Um, I would just like to very much at this time uh, welcome um, Dr. Kevin Clazel as our featured speaker today. Kevin serves as director of the Oklahoma Climatological Survey, one of the largest such surveys in the country. He also serves on the State of Oklahoma Hazard Mitigation Task Force. Kevin is a tenured associate professor with teaching and research interests focusing on societal impacts and decision making in weather impacted situations. He led the teams that won the Innovations in American Government Award from Harvard University and the Ford Foundation for their work with the emergency management community in Oklahoma, as well as awards from the American Meteorological Society and the National Weather Association. Kevin was awarded the American Meteorological Society's 2015 Charles E. Anderson Award for over two decades of dedication to engaging minority and underrepresented groups through community outreach and academic leadership. Kevin is also a certified emergency manager in the state of Oklahoma. Kevin, overjoyed and ecstatic to have you with us today. Go ahead and take it away. We'll pass you the baton. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to see what I do next, which is... PowerPoint and show PowerPoint and over here. Larry, if you can still hear me, can you see that slide? That looks fantastic, good to go. Kevin. Awesome. All right. Um, well, absolutely, I'm overjoyed uh, to be with everybody today. Uh, I can tell you that it has been nine months since the uh, National Climate Assessment came out. Uh, in those nine months, I've had the opportunity to do approximately 600 of various functions as it pertains to either interviews or radio spots or webinars or presentations at local Kiwanis, you know, whatever it happens to be up Man, you guys, this is the best run of all of them. This was easy, easy, easy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I will preface what I say uh, in a couple of ways. One, uh, these three states that are represented in the Southern Great Plains chapter, this is a change from National Climate Assessment 3, where the entire Great Plains was grouped together. And of course, that becomes an incredibly daunting challenge because of the diversity from the Texas Gulf Coast all the way up to the Canadian border. And then on the west side of the plains, the Rockies, all the way over into uh, the Mississippi Valley. This is an incredibly diverse region. So breaking it up into Northern Great Plains and Southern Great Plains made perfect sense. Uh, then of course, when you bunch the states of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, 
uh, you run into that whole other country issue uh, where, of course, most of the population in the region is in Texas, most of the real estate in this region is in Texas, uh, and you have me sitting here in Norman, Oklahoma, uh, trying to be the uh, arbiter slash referee uh, to make sure that what's in the report and in the limited page real estate that we have uh, gets conveyed in a way that's, that's both clear and impactful. That is an incredibly difficult challenge. And so uh, I can tell you right off the bat when I was invited by the national parks that I went, oh my gosh, we really didn't talk about the parks at all uh, in our chapter. Um, and I'll also preface this by saying that all of this information is now dated, right? It's old, which means that we started this process in 2016 uh, from trying to put together an author team that represented the climatologists, the state climatologists in Kansas and in Oklahoma and in Texas, uh, people from all of the states, from the tribes. We had numerous listening workshops. Uh, we had multiple in-person workshops where we invited in stakeholders uh, and the like. So this was a millions of pieces of information trying to distill it down into about 20 to 25 pages. Um, it is a task that I hope I never have to do again because uh, I can tell you we left so many things out, right, that are, that are really important. So the opportunity today to visit with the National Park Service folks, this is an incredible uh, sort of a reboot on this chapter as to how the things that we found and the research that's being done in this portion of the country uh, really does impact the uh, the park service. So we are gonna talk specifically about some of the parks in the region, and I do wanna remind you that this is not to scale, uh, that you know these are the, the kinds of things that we deal with across everything in the climate report, right? Not to scale can be an important thing to note because anybody knows that with statistics, you can almost make statistics look the way you want to by just changing scale. So that's the first thing I'll say as we get into the meat of this is make sure that we're understanding if you have any questions about scales on any of the, the diagrams or, or what the units are or anything like that, by all means, uh, say something. Of course, probably the big deal uh, as it pertains to our part of the world is heat. and one of the things that we wrestle with is there's not really anything significant about 100 degree days in the grand scheme of things. In fact, if you look at heat illness and heat fatalities, uh, the average temperature on a heat fatality day is only 90 Fahrenheit. I can tell you this from the social behavioral side, people think differently about 99 degrees than they do about 100. So when you're trying to socialize important information, especially with the public, uh, it's important to put it in their terms. Uh, and in their terms, people tend to want to talk about 100 being hot and 99 being not hot. So we chose to use increase in number of days above 100 to try and look at various emission scenarios. And you can see on these graphs, uh, this is not good news, especially for those of us who are embroiled in a, in a current heat wave, especially here in Oklahoma. We've had heat advisories. Uh, in our state for the last seven days in a row. Today, we finally got a few clouds, so we'll get a little bit of a respite before it comes back. But this is something that is going to be threaded throughout the key messages of the chapter. Uh, I'm gonna go through those five key messages with you today uh, that were from the chapter and then try and put these five key messages in the context of the parks. But know in the back of your mind uh, that this is a very daunting and compelling graphic that would suggest that depending upon the emission scenario, that we're looking at anywhere between an additional 30 to 60 in terms of the number of days above 100 in these regions. And that's, that's a little scary when you're talking about, you know, a month or more of additional 100 degree days uh, in the late 21st century versus what we experience today. So of course, when we're dealing with this kind of temperature structure, of course, that meant our first key message had to be right up front with the things that matter most to the people in the region, food, energy, and water. And these are uh, sort of this incredible number of population. It's about 37 or so million that are in the region, about 30 million of that in Texas. It seems like half of that's you know, either in Dallas or on the Gulf Coast. Um, 
there's no doubt in our mind that quality of life in the region will be compromised. It's a region that's increasing population. We're seeing a migration of people from rural to urban locations and changing climate will redistribute the demands at the intersection of food, energy, and water. And you need each of those to do the other, right? You can't really process or move water without energy and you can't certainly grow food without water. Um, and so we're at the point now where I hate to say this, but uh, you know, the changes that we're seeing, these, these changes are already occurring. And any of the changes we talk about today, as I mentioned, you know, you might as well go back to 2016 because that's when we started this process, ultimately published in 18, ultimately talking about it today in late 2019. Uh, but most of what's in the report had to be cut off in sort of that 2015, 2016 timeframe. So there are many changes that have already occurred. Harvey was occurring right at the tail end. And so uh, we were able to, to kind of change things around and, and add some, some Hurricane Harvey things into the chapter. But uh, it is going to be key to have improved climate services and early warning decision support systems. Uh, because this is now, we're talking about the monitoring piece of this is going to be of utmost importance as we go forward. And that's monitoring for everything. That's monitoring water, that's monitoring species, that's monitoring invasive species, the move of these species from one place to another. Uh, and this is incredibly important to the region because when you look at where we sit with water supply, uh, and of course, Big Ben sitting right in the middle of this, we're forced to be sort of in the adaptation part of climate change. So how do we manage water resources? And does that mean, well, we need more reservoirs? Does that mean we need more dams? Does that need, you know, what are those man-made kinds of things that humans as a society sort of impose to adapt to our changing climate? And then what influence might that have on the parks uh, and their locations. And in this particular case, anything that would happen, uh, whether that's, you know, up at Elephant Butte in New Mexico or, or you know, wherever, right? We're talking about even not only the U.S., but transnational things, right? So when we're talking about Big Bend, that reach of the Rio Grande River that goes through there, you know, has both U.S. and Mexico as its upstream watershed. And so, it's not just something that we can do by ourselves. There are going to have to be some transnational, transboundary uh, adaptation strategies and discussions. And I think that's something we're forgetting, right? We can't just solve this issue as the U.S. We are going to have to do this in partnership with our neighbors in particular, uh, but our global partners as well. And I think that that's something that uh, that I think many people kind of overlook. It's kind of like, what can I do? And that's great. Uh, but from a standpoint of leadership, we really need to have better relationships with our neighbors as we, we move forward in this climate change era. The other thing that we're trying to do now to sort of focus on this transboundary transnational is that we uh, highlighted in the chapter some things that are going on uh, across the border. And not only going across on, on across the border, but in multiple languages, right? We felt it was incredibly important uh, to attempt to translate the outcomes, the messages, the impacts uh, into multiple languages, because we have people who are bilingual uh, that live on both sides of the border. And in fact, in our entire region, if you look at I-35 going up from Texas through Oklahoma through Kansas, um, and I, I can tell you this, if you've traveled I-35, you can find just as good a Mexican food in Kansas as you can in Oklahoma, as you can in Texas. And that is a testament to the diversity that is taking place in our three states in the Southern Great Plains. So we have to be very much cognizant of that and very much cognizant about how we try to, uh, you know, push the results of these kinds of things. It is, uh, again, an incredibly diverse environment. I mentioned it from an ecosystem standpoint earlier, but from a people standpoint as well. And that's an amazing thing. We had a great diverse group of people that came to our listening sessions here in Oklahoma when we had them. Uh, and it's something we'd like to continue to do, right? I'm hopeful that uh, we can continue to have these kinds of discussions even in the interim periods uh, when a climate assessment hasn't just been put out. So 
um, hopefully we can continue these discussions as we go forward. That being said, uh, infrastructure was our key message number two. Uh, the built environment, uh, and like I said, we didn't really talk about parks, but boy, as I got the invite from Larry and others and started thinking about infrastructure, thinking about parks as infrastructure and infrastructure within parks uh, and how we go forward. Man, the first thing that popped into my head was one of my favorite places in the planet. Um, I don't know if you can see Orbit behind me. I'm a huge Houston Astros fan. They're double-A franchises in Corpus Christi. Uh, I'm from Texas originally, so I get a chance to spend quite a bit of time uh, over my life cycle, my life period in South Texas and on Padre Island. It is amazing, the Padre Island of my youth versus the Padre Island today uh, and the changes, uh, the sea level rise that has already taken place on the Texas coast the erosion that you can see almost on a regular basis that uh, you really didn't see before. And this is not erosion after a storm, right? This is erosion after high tide. Um, and this progression of inch by inch by inch on the Texas coast, all the way up and down the coast, and the fact that the state of Texas um, has recognized this as an issue. Now, the state of Texas doesn't tend to like to use the word climate change uh, in any of its uh, information about how you spend on mitigation and, and things like that, but over $12 billion have already been spent. Um, and of course, the Texas Gulf Coast has an $11.6 billion storm surge protection plan now in place uh, that is, you know, sort of going forward. Uh, it's amazing because I sit in Oklahoma, and if any of you are out there going, how on earth is there a climate survey in Oklahoma, given sort of the, and I'll say it, right, I'll be the first one up front to say it, the political leanings of the Oklahoma congressional delegation and state delegations as it pertains to climate change, uh, I look at this as an opportunity, right? This is a huge opportunity uh, to try and, you know, if we have to couch it in different terms, so be it as long as we get the results we're after, uh, which is an awareness that our surroundings are changing and we're not going to get the Padre Island of Kevin's childhood back uh, probably not in my lifetime or in my children's lifetime. Um, you don't have to look much farther than the USGS Coastal Vulnerability Index sitting on top of the Padre Island National Seashore uh, to see that it ranks amongst the most vulnerable pieces of land anywhere in the United States. Uh, and of course, I am thrilled to see that the National Park Service is also aggressively uh, pushing information through its own uh, National Resource Report Series. This is one in 2018. Of course, we didn't have access to this particular report or this particular vulnerability index when we did the uh, the actual chapter, but these are important pieces that continue to build on the findings in the chapter. Uh, the ability to run sort of sea level rise models with storm surge uh, to look and see what might happen if you had a Category 4 or, you know, any sort of Category Sapper Simpson hurricane. Uh, and the fact that Padre Island is one of those places that is temporary on this planet, right? I mean, we can try and, and put things back, but boy, Earth tends to win, and Earth with man's help is going to win, right? That's just the bottom line. Um, and so the amount of money that is being spent on, on mitigation and these strategies, it's, it's fantastic to see, but it makes me wonder, uh, in hindsight, if it wouldn't have been a lot cheaper had we recognized this issue a lot sooner and acted, because now, um, and I think we see this in the disaster literature, for every dollar we would have spent in mitigation, we're spending $7 after the fact in response and recovery, and that's that's no way to run a budget uh, by always knowing you're going to spend seven times more if you procrastinate than if you're proactive. And so, again, preaching proactivity, uh, but boy, we are really late to the game as it pertains to proactivity when we're dealing uh, with Padre Island and the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, a third key message in our chapter was on uh, ecosystems and ecosystem services. And this was where we really found some interesting results because we've seen both the elimination of species due to climate change everywhere on the planet, 
But we've also seen some species that adapt to extreme droughts, to floods, to wildfires. Um, and so we've kind of got the key message three couched in the chapter amongst what we would call winners or losers. And uh, again, I mentioned my affinity for the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, my uncle had one of those flounder boats. We used to trudge through the, the marshes, not only of the bays around Corpus, but even up the coast toward Port Lavaca and Matagorda Bay, you know, trudging through and digging flounder. And, uh, and so the Southern flounder was something I grew up eating, grilling, et cetera, as well as gray snapper. Um, what we're seeing along the Texas Gulf Coast with climate change influences is that the southern flounder population is actually decreasing, but while at the same time the gray snapper population is increasing. And so these water temperature changes along the Texas Gulf Coast, um, which support, you know, sport fishing, et cetera, um, gray snapper is a winner, but flounder is a loser. And this is uh, you know, not only on the, the species and sort of the food chain side, but also on the recreational side with sport fishing and things like that. Uh, when doing a little more research about uh, what goes on in the Big Bend area, it's very, very clear that uh, species like the Kalima warbler are being impacted. And of course, that is a very small breeding area that's in Mexico that extends up uh, into the Big Bend National Park area. But uh, the Kalima warbler is one of those species that right now I think is going to be on the losing end of this, not the winning end. Um, we can also talk about the tall grass prairie. Um, gosh, this is really scary, right? Because so many of our folks in this region depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. And so when the dominant forage grass in Kansas and across Oklahoma uh, when we're talking about diminishing that to maybe half of its current stature during the next, you know, 50 to 75 years, uh, it's essentially two things, right? The amount of it and the size of it. And when we're talking about national recreation areas that are named tall grass prairie and you get there and there's no tall grass, uh, this is this is an issue, right? We're talking about uh, un all you have to do to understand climate change is to look really at names of national parks uh, because some of those names don't apply anymore. And that's, that's, a, that's a real struggle, um, you know, at least me from a family perspective of visiting, of visiting national parks and things like that. I can't say that everybody's a loser. Uh, the, Chickasha, the Chickasaw, sorry, national uh, area. Oh, I don't know why we're binging. Um, did you hear the bing? Maybe it's just me. Um, the Chickasaw NRA is likely to be a winner. Uh, it could actually serve as a colonization species refuge. Uh, what we tell people typically is Oklahoma is not the canary in the coal mine as it pertains to climate change. Oklahoma, we're not seeing very strong influences of changes in 100 degree days right now or you know any differences from 30 years ago we have the same droughts and floods that we've always had we have the same number of tornadoes that we've always had uh, and of course this is a challenge when you think about climate locally right because it's no secret that our congressional delegation in oklahoma is not really understanding that climate change is an issue on a larger scale because if you do look at oklahoma we're not really noticing the same kinds of changes that you would notice, say, in Big Bend Park, along the Rio Grande, up in the tall grass areas, in the uh, Texas Gulf Coast, you know, all of those places. So there may be some opportunities for the National Park Service going forward. Uh, here in Oklahoma, this is not a commercial, by the way, since I'm in Oklahoma, but, uh, but certainly places like the Chickasaw NRA and the opportunities for colonization and species uh, sort of refuge, um, species improvement, as well as to study the ability to, to, go, to you know, go through environmental change and the like. Uh, there may be some really cool research opportunities in the national parks going forward particularly in the area of ecosystem and ecosystem improvement. Uh, and I think that's one of the places that, you know, we think about national parks sometimes from a standpoint of people coming to visit. Uh, but uh, our national parks could be incredible testing ground, proving grounds, research grounds, et cetera, going forward. 
uh, looking at, you know, even in this particular scenario, by, by emissions pathway and by season, uh, the climate suitability of places like the Chickasaw NRA for many species that we see is actually quite good and quite stable. Um, I just mentioned people uh, and people coming to parks. And of course, our key method, message number four was about human health, uh, particularly heat illness and diseases transmitted through food, water, insects, um, longer days, more moisture in the atmosphere, higher wet bulb globe temperature, higher incidences of heat illness. I mean, honestly, look at every imaginable weather disaster out there. And we have somewhat mitigated upward trends in fatalities in every area but heat. We just haven't solved that issue. Uh, this is especially problematic this time of year as we send people back to school, back to football practice, back to band practice, all of those things, we are continuing to see increases in heat fatalities through outdoor activities. Uh, and those not only are on the rise, we don't have a good answer for those right now. Um, and part of that is temperature, but the other part of that is the amount of moisture that's now in the atmosphere uh, that is greater than, than it used to be. And I just was overjoyed when I was visiting uh, many of the National Park Service websites and, and things like that, the, if there is a primary push already, right? And I mentioned it earlier, you don't want to wait till people start dying, you know, regularly uh, to start doing mitigation. You want to be proactive. And it looks like the National Park Service has really taken this to heart, not just in our region, but across uh, the U.S. There's research projects out there, for example, the one in wilderness environment uh, medication which is looking at exertional heat related illnesses in Grand Canyon, at Zion, uh, you know, et cetera. So I, I thought it was interesting that I found this quote in one of the papers, national park visitors don't always understand the need to avoid the heat of the day, which is why dehydration, heat exhaustion, heat stroke can put a damper on activities and even send visitors to the hospital. <laughs> don't we know it, right? I am on the campus of the University of Oklahoma, which has a very highly ranked football team. And that highly ranked football team prefers practicing between 2 and 5 p.m. And then we have to figure out a way to mitigate through hydration and things like that. Um, you know, when people get into the park, they're bulletproof. They're invincible. They're, you know, all of those things that, that pop up. Uh, they like to interact with species. They, they just aren't smart a lot of the time. Uh, and climate change is going to take a heavy toll on the not smart going forward. And, and that's a little bit disconcerting. Our last key message in the chapter was key message five, which is indigenous peoples. Um, we had tribes heavily represented, of course, not only because of the tribal presence in Oklahoma and Kansas and to some extent Texas, uh, but this is where we tend to see a lot of the climate impacts first uh, because it's use of either species for ceremonies or uh, community resilience because of infrastructure limitations or things like that. Um, and so this is something that I don't want to disjoint it from the park discussion too much, uh, but I will say this, right? One of the things that the ind indigenous peoples are very, very keen on are, are learning from history, right? They are absolutely sort of have that climate bank in their mind of what things were like how things have changed. They are so well aware and self-aware of their surroundings that change to them becomes very evident, right? With us in our houses, in our air conditioning, in our cars, and you know, our awareness is when the road is closed or whether there's traffic or, you know, we sort of lose our awareness of environment and we sort of focus our awareness powers in our brain on built environment and, oh, wow, that's a new billboard. And, oh, wow, when did that restaurant get here? And, and those kinds of things. We really need to go back and learn from the indigenous peoples as it pertains to climate change and our awareness. And I thought it was fascinating and I thought I would bring this up because um, one of the things we can't fail to do is we can't fail to learn from history, right? Oklahoma used to have a, a national park and it was Platt National Park. Um, and so you can go back through Oklahoma history and the popularity of Platte National Park, uh, which is now the Chickasaw uh, NRA. 
Uh, but the Chickasaw NRA looks incredibly different from what the Platte National Park looked like because of things that we've done to our landscape, right? We have very much changed what the Chickasaw NRA looks like from what it looked like when it was Platte National Park. Um, and in some of these instances, uh, this demotion of national parks or this reduced emphasis on national parks um, is really, I think, a threat now. And I think if we can pull the national parks into more of the, you know, the research test bed place, where yes, it's for people and yes, they're revenue generating. But I think if we continue to promote these as test beds for research, species research, climate change research, et cetera, uh, and then maybe we can, we can actually save some of these parks from demise as we go forward. Um, one of the last things that I will mention is we have been hard at work across our three states. Kansas now has a state mesonet. Oklahoma has, has had a state mesonet for 25 years. Uh, Texas Tech has installed a mesonet in the Panhandle, and then Texas A&M is working on a mesonet for the remainder of the state. The Lower Colorado River Authority has rain gauges all over central Oklahoma. What I mean by mesonet is a way of monitoring atmospheric and subsurface conditions, soil temperature, soil moisture, uh, rainfall, humidity, and maintaining these networks as research quality networks. Because the first thing that anybody who is going to take issue with climate work is going to say is, well, that temperature device isn't the same as it was 50 years ago. Or, well, now there's an airport next door to that and there wasn't before, so naturally it's gonna be warmer. Um, what we try to do is we try to maintain pristine siting with these sites so that over the long-term record, we can actually make meaningful comparisons. So moving forward, it sort of begs the question that our national parks may also be great locations for more monitoring sites with, as it pertains to, to things like precipitation, atmospheric moisture, subsurface temperature and moisture, et cetera. Uh, and we may think going forward about how we better instrument or how we better monitor our parks because of some of the pristine conditions that these parks are in uh, as it pertains to, to climate change. The longer we can keep an environment as similar as we can, the better off we're going to be from trying to assess what the real changes actually are. Um, with that, I'm going to sort of close here with two key takeaways. Um, of course, national parks are subject to the same concerns regarding climate change as any state, county, city, or individual. Um, in some instances, parks can serve as canaries in the coal mine to serve as sentinels for the impacts of climate change on more pristine, less inhabited environments. It's sort of the point I just made. Monitoring in your world, I think, is going to be key for us on the climate research side going forward uh, to be able to determine exactly what's going on with our atmosphere uh, because you know, in some of these urban areas that weren't urban, boy, it's problematic to try uh, and do that now. And the national parks may be our savior going forward for monitoring. Um, and then number two, I mean, this is my personal crusade, right? Uh, almost everything in Oklahoma is place-based, right? Place-based naming. So, for example, here in Norman, Oklahoma, we have Flood Street. Now, when the people built on Flood Street, you have to wonder, you know, should you get flood insurance? And I'm like, you live on Flood Street. Well, guess what flooded? Flood Street. There's a reason why the name of the street was Flood Street. It's what happens there. But when we look nationally at our national park, and we have a glacier national park, and all I see is how much of its glacier is gone. Um, we have the Tall Grass Prairie National Preserve, and the amount of tall grass in that tall grass prairie is way less than it used to be and getting lower. And so we're at the point now where it's sort of the artist formerly known as Prince, right? It's, we see these ancient names associated with these parks, but you almost have to say, well, it's the National Park formerly known as Glacier or the Prairie National Preserve formerly known as Tallgrass. Um, those changes are real. Those changes are unambiguous. Those changes are due to climate change. And I, I don't know how much more strongly I can put that. Um, with that, I will 
open it up for questions and discussion. And you've got an amazing panel uh, coming up here shortly as well. So with that, I will stop and turn it back over to Larry. Man, Kevin, thank you so much, so much great meat in that short presentation for us to sink our teeth into and there are things I certainly want to follow up on there. Uh, at the moment, all our participants, uh, just so you know, this is your golden opportunity. You can again either use that raise your hand icon if you'd like to bring your voice into the room or use the questions panel to type in your questions and we have a few things in queue at the moment. Kevin, we're going to leave you at the moment with a presenter role right now in case you want to reference any of your slides in your answers. So with that, I open oh, it up sure, to okay. the group. Uh, yeah, Larry, so far we've gotten a uh, comment, uh, you, Kevin, you are welcomed warmly from folks up the road in Oklahoma City, one of our parks up there, they wanted to say hi. Uh, we had some questions, um, you had showed uh, a screenshot from a, a bird brief, and I wanted to, someone was asking about, a little bit about that for Chickasaw, and so I want to just post a link into the chat where if you thought that was kind of interesting about the birds there at Chickasaw, um, here in the chat, I'm just going to put in the link. I sent that out to everyone where you can see, similarly for your park, the projections for uh, the bird response to climate change. See what some of those winners might be, some of, see what some of those losers might be, um, kind of like Kevin pointed out there for Chickasaw. Right. And I, pr I probably should have mentioned, right, these, these in these pieces of information were not available to us at the time of our work. And there's a lot of stuff that has happened since across, especially across the national parks. Uh, I, again, getting the invitation to do this really pushed me to read many of those research uh, resource reports that have been done, particularly in the last two years since we kind of had to put a moratorium on the information uh, that was available for the report. And that's always the challenge, right? Because there are so many rules, right? <laughs> you know, you, okay, you can't have anything after this point and, and on and on and on. It goes through multiple levels of peer review, et cetera. So the, uh, many of the national park studies that I've seen are really, really good and really are of value to our national climate assessments going forward. Excellent. And, uh, we and also had a request. Uh, Go ahead, Larry. I just wanted to say, you know, Kevin, you mentioned that parks have a golden opportunity to be testing grounds and proving grounds for what we see happening with regards to climate change. And I just wanted to mention with regards to this particular work that was done, you know, in the wake of this study, Audubon initiated something called the Climate Watch Program, which is a citizen science effort that looks to ground truth uh, really what is projected in some of this work. And it's a real golden opportunity that parks can participate in to really uh, utilize citizen science to sort of gauge how this sort of projected change is, trans, tra is really happening on the landscape in real time. And in a very real way, you know, you mentioned it in, in communicating this issue with people, it's best to use their language, use language that works for them and things certainly. If birds are the platform to talk about this topic, that might be the hook to get people interested in this sort of work in the future. So really glad you brought up that study in particular. Yeah, Larry, I, I completely agree with you. I, I, I think you have a gold mine of real estate that probably we should have thoughtful conversations about how it's instrumented to monitor not only species, but the actual environmental conditions and the microclimates, right, that take place in these areas. Thank, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Larry. I also just posted a link to Climate Watch there in the chat as well. Um, we did have a, a request. Um, if you could scroll to slide number eight, there was someone that wanted to get a screen capture of that slide. I do not recall what the slide was offhand, but it says number eight. That one? Or this uh, one? Looks like it must be key message number two. Um, Jennifer, you can confirm in the questions box if, if we have that right or not. In the meantime, I will go on to the next question while waiting for that confirmation. Um, this Question comes from our friend Bob. He uh, says, a uh, simple question. He is new to Big Bend. He thinks that some ways interpreting climate change here is hard, as people already expect it to be hot and dry. So what would be your one sentence or one paragraph elevator speech on how climate change would impact 
a place like Big Bend National Park? And how do we make the point that it isn't going to be the same hot and dry uh, that it used to be? This might also be a great question for a panel later today, but let's let's uh, give you first crack at it, Kevin. Sure, I, I will go so far as to talk about how much water is in the Rio Grande now, right? I mean, this very rapid shift from intense drought to the pluvial or almost in flood conditions because of the massive amounts of snowfall that occurred over the Southern Rockies. Uh, as you go more and more from nothing to flood to nothing to flood, the amount of erosion that takes place, the changing of the landscape, the, I mean, so it may be subtle when you, when you actually think about how that works. And I don't know that I have a great answer for somebody who wants a, a one line, well, it's always hot out here <laughs> kind of thing. Um, the problem with the amount of moisture that we're seeing in terms of the increase is that it may make it a little bit harder on human health, which will make it harder on energy consumption, which will make it harder on your wallet. All right, one more thing. We so that that was not the right uh, slide. It was actually a slide they wanted, uh, maybe the one before about Padre Island. Um, I think this uh, there's actually two people. Someone else wanted a screenshot of this graph as well. Do you, are you willing to share your slide deck? Like after, can we Absolutely. send up follow up? I'm happy to. Yes. Yeah. Larry, Larry, is that something we can do, share this slide deck with all the attendees in the follow-up email that you'll send out? Yep, I, I'm happy to do that, and thank you, Kevin, for making that available. Although, Kevin, I'm glad someone brought that slide up. If you would pull that slide back up again, that very first one, I was wondering if you could speak to that very first line that's across the top says uh, portions of the Texas coast, I believe, are experiencing one inch of sea level rise a year. That's an eye-popping figure. And it seems yeah, to be and, somewhat in contrast to the graphic on the lower left. So there's so there are several time scales at work here, right? So the one from the NOAA study that's Texas A&M that's on the bottom, those are the original projections of sea level rise from the uh, from the report. And then the upper graph is the actual sea level rise since 1950 with the baseline of 1950. And what we're seeing is that the rate of change has shifted from the 2006 time frame or so, which is the area that's in red on the graphic. So the rate of increase is now has now accelerated to approximately an inch a year. And so one of the wow. things that you'll see over on the right hand side is, is that there is both a path and a range, right? And so that path is sort of the real, you know, the estimate, but with the error bars on either side. So it's it's impossible to pinpoint a number and not have error bars associated with it. But over the past eight or so, about the last decade, we have seen about a 10 inch rise in sea level over the last decade on the Texas coast. And that is a much wow. steeper rate of change than the rates of sea level rise that are used in the estimates going forward, which are the ones in the lower graphic. I probably should have been more clear yeah, on that slide that, when I went past it. Yeah, it's it's the instantaneous last decade, which is very concerning, versus the initial estimates of sea level rise this of that. Excellent. Thanks for the clarification. That is mind blowing. Excellent. Um, I do want to move on. Before I do that, Kat, are you still on the line with us? Yeah. Yeah. And I I just wanted to. Uh, Give a hearty thanks, Kevin, to you for your talk. It was outstanding, very tangible. You really brought home the key messages in a way that are very practical 
and you certainly spoke to the Park Service specifically, which was fantastic. I got a lot out of your talk, everything from I made a note for future road trips to uh, go to Kansas and enjoy Mexican food along I-35. Yes, um, absolutely. I, and I, yeah, and I know your uh, fishing strategy may have to shift over to Snapper. Um, and lastly, I couldn't agree with you more about Park Service as a place to monitor, a place to conduct research. We we certainly endorse that. And interestingly, I have a slide I've often used in slide decks that does exactly what you just said about Park Service, our names, the names of various parks, and the implications of climate change for those names. So thank you very, very much. That was right on target. And I want to also thank Patrick Gonzalez. I think he's on the line. Patrick is on our team. And Patrick has helped us organize all of these webinar roundtables with the speakers from the National Climate Assessment. So excellent. Thanks so much, Kevin. Absolutely. Thanks, Kat, for your kind words. And again, I'll echo too with Patrick and Larry and the crew. This was, I mean, I've done hundreds of these and this was easy, easy, easy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Kat. Uh, thanks to everyone for your questions. And thank you, Kevin. Kevin's graciously agreed to stay on the line with us to answer additional questions as they arise. So he'll be with us for the duration of the call. At this time, I'd like to also invite our panel of um, invited guests attending today from the Southern Great Plains Parks. As we kick off our panel discussion, I want to remind and encourage all of you to send in your questions for any of the speakers as you think of them using the questions panel, and we will raise them at the very first opportunity. I am now really pleased to introduce my colleague in the Climate Change Response Program, David Lawrence. Dave Lawrence is an aquatic ecologist with a particular focus on climate science and conservation planning at national, regional, and local scales. In 2017, Dave joined our team, the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program, as an ecologist. In this position, he evaluates and communicates the effects of climate change on NPS resources through a combination of research, technical support, and science translation to park managers. So, David, thank you very much for joining us today, and welcome to you. Thanks so much, Larry. Um, and, and I wanted to echo those thanks to, to Kevin. That was really a, uh, an outstanding presentation for, for the NCA chapter there related to the Southern Great Plains. Um, the purpose of this portion of the, the uh, roundtable is to ground some of the NCA results um, in, with perspectives from managers and scientists in the field. Um, so our goal here is to hear about some of the region-specific stories about whether and how climate change is affecting park resources now or concerns about climate change vulnerabilities in the future. And so with that, I'd like to first introduce a couple of folks from the Park Service. Uh, first, uh, Mark Spear, uh, and he is a superintendent from the South Texas Group, and he manages both Padre, Padre Island National Seashore in Corpus Christi, Texas, as well as Palo Alto Battlefield National Historical Park in Bronzeville, Texas. Uh, Mark is a 40-year veteran of the National Park Service with service in nine park areas, including Horseshoe Bend, the Everglades, Big Cypress, Olympic, Big Bend, Chiricahua, and Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. So welcome to you, Mark. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Don Cork. Uh, so Don uh, became a fan of Big Bend while working as a petroleum geologist in Midland, Texas back in the early 80s. Uh, when the oil business crashed in the mid-1980s, he went back to school, he went to grad school at Texas A&M to study archeology. span and that led to Don's first National Park Service job as an archaeological technician at Big Bend in 1990. And he worked as, the, uh, as an architect there for, four, for 13 years. Uh, over, the, over his time there, he gradually accreted geological duties until the park finally made it official and they transferred him into the geologist job series. And Don has served as the Big Bend uh, geologist over the past 16 years. So thank you, Don, for joining us as well. My pleasure. Um, we also invited Michael Langston from the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center to join this discussion uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the Climate Adaptation Science Centers and how they can provide uh, support to land managers in responding to climate change. In terms of Mike's uh, biography, 
He currently serves as the Deputy Director at South Central CASC in Norman, Oklahoma, and he formerly served as the Assistant Director of the Oklahoma Water Resources Research Institute from 2004 to 2014. And prior to that, he worked uh, 14 years in environmental research and consulting in Florida, where he focused on treating wastewater using wetlands and the ecology of T&E species, threatened and endangered species. Uh, since he uh, returned to Oklahoma in 2000, his interests and expertise um, have and experience have really focused on developing protocols for involving stakeholders in watershed management decision making, watershed policy development, uh, and the nexus of water and energy development. So uh, I really appreciate uh, Mike, you joining as well. So with that, I'd like to uh, start with some questions. So I'll, I'll ask some questions uh, and then we'll uh, open it up, I, I believe, to the, uh, the rest of the folks that are listening in on the call to provide their questions. Um, this first uh, set of questions, um, well, actually, before I do that, let's go ahead and do a little audience involvement here. Um, Specific to, uh, to the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, Michael had a question just to, uh, for folks. I'm going to go ahead and throw that up. In terms um, of, um, are they familiar with that? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. So we're going to do a poll question. This is going to show up on everyone's screen. I'm not sure if the panelists will be able to see it, but definitely all you attendees. So first, we wanted to ask, are you familiar with the Climate Adaptation Centers uh, of the USGS? And I've got the poll open. You can go ahead and click either yes or no and then vote. Looks like over half of you have voted so far. Uh, I'm going to just hold it open a little bit longer. We're up to a little over 60%. Five, four, last chance to get it in. This is a neck and neck race. Hurry now to <laughs> have your team win. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it. And uh, so the attendees, you can see the results now. The panelists, you won't be able to see it, so I will read it for you. 52% um, are, yes, familiar with them, and 48% are not. So we've got basically a perfect split right here. Okay. That's great. Well, that's, that's good information to have, and I think we'll return to that probably when we get to some questions for, uh, for Michael. Um, but I wanted to start with uh, uh, with Don and Mark, um, and either of you feel free to, to uh, take the lead in answering uh, this question. Um, I wanted to start with uh, just just a, a, a park specific question. So, is the park is your park dealing with climate change issues right now? And if so, um, can you describe them? You want to go, Don? Um. <laughs> Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, the, we, we already talked about Padre Island on your side. Um, I think we are. Uh, one of the, we're seeing more extreme events here. And when the, uh, the climate folks came uh, and, and worked on Big Bend and kind of tried to give us a, a snapshot of what to expect in the future, the very simplified version that really stuck with me, y'all looked at um, kind of the, the, the proportion of good days average days and bad days or good or, or years even um, and projected that in the future we were going to see a lot fewer good days and, and good years and a lot more bad days and bad years and uh, we see that here um, I'll talk about it a little more later I think but in 2011 we had a profound drought extremely bad. Uh, we probably lost 30 to 40 percent of our woodland up in our Sky Island in the Chisos Mountains. Um, and it's the kind of thing you don't bounce back from. So um, that and, and the, the Texas Forest Service talked about this would the, we would see the effects of this for 10 years. And sure enough, we are still seeing effects of this drought. Um, so uh, there's that. Uh, and uh, of course, water's a, a big issue here. And so we see less flow in the Rio Grande. Sometimes it dries up and doesn't even flow through this reach of the river. Kevin kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, and maybe to understand Big Bend, we should go through this slide deck real quick if you'd like to. Um, so uh, we talk about Big Bend being kind of three parks in one. We simplify it as the mountains, uh, the desert that surrounds the mountains and the river. So three different places to recreate in Big Bend. 
So uh, next slide. Uh, we'll kind of go from the mountains down to the river. We'll just drop down an elevation in these uh, 10 or 11 slides I have. So that is the Sky Island. The part that sticks up higher, the, the high point is a little over 7,800 feet high. And so up in that, uh, we, there's a lot of recreation. It's the place you go this time of year to leave the heat behind. Um, there's usually about a 20 degree swing in temperature in highs and lows uh, between the, the high elevations and the lowest elevations. And there's probably over a half mile of elevation change within the park boundary from the 7,800 down to, to about 2,000 in the lower, the lower areas. Next slide. As we fly in a little closer over this, that's Emory Peak on the right side. That's the high point. And these are extinct volcanoes. But you see they're carpeted with these forests. It's mostly an oak, pinion, juniper forest. Although up here, um, there are a few aspen. There's some dug fir and some other species, some maple trees, big tooth maples, that are able to survive. Um, this area gets 25 to 30 inches of rain a year. Next slide. Um, it's also a big recreation area. This is one of the, the backpacking campsites. It's also a place where our big charismatic uh, wildlife lives. And in that 2011 drought that we had, we lost almost all of our black bear population. Uh, they died out or they emigrated back into Mexico where they originally came from. Next slide. Um, as you move down out of that, that high elevation, you move into, kind of, into an arid grassland. Um, and there's always sort of a tug of war, that boundary between that oak, pinion, juniper forest, um, and uh, the grassland is the tug of war. Uh, and so I think that is probably moving. I'm not a botanist, but uh, to me, that's something we ought to be monitoring. Um, and those plants that can hang on, that have a good established deep root system, um, that, can, that can survive um, will persist. But if you have that bad 2011 drought and they get wiped out, they won't reestablish. Uh, because they, they, they don't have the deep roots. Next slide. Um, and this is sort of the desert scrub. The areas um, probably start with this bushier uh, scrub, scrub land, um, but uh, that's intersp interspersed with grasslands and the kind of the medium elevations. Next slide. And as we go down closer to the river, that's Mexico on the skyline there in the distance. Um, but there's a lot more bare and open ground. Um, our grasslands were really hammered by human overgrazing, well, humans bringing in too much livestock to, that overgrazed. So our grasslands are were at lowest elevations are in terrible shape, not anything like what the earliest settlers saw when they got here 100, 150 years ago. Um, and we're trying to reestablish those in certain areas. Next slide. And then we get down to the riparian zone. And this is obviously crucial in an arid environment, uh, both for, uh, for natural resources and for recreation. Uh, next slide. And so this is Santa Elena Canyon. This is how I, where I first fell in love with Big Bend. That's Mexico on the left and Texas on the right. So obviously cooperating with our neighbors to the south is extremely important. And next and last slide. And this is a sad slide. So this is the Rio Grande again. That's the High Chisos Mountains off in the skyline in the distance. And in the, the, in the lower third of the slide is vegetation that should be green. This is that drought of 2011. So you see it had a profound effect on uh, what we see in the park. Um, and so with the sad future we're looking at, I think this, these extremes uh, of, of good years and bad years have a profound effect. And in my 30 years here, um, I've see, also seen the flip side, which was two really good years. My, my first two years here, 90 and 91, were really wet years. And some of the, uh, the ephemeral uh, water courses here had surface water uh, year round during those wet years. Um, and the cottonwood trees were able to, to sprout and grow into saplings and establish a root system 
that could tap into the subsurface water when that water retreated back into the gravels during the, the subsequent years. And so the stands of cottonwoods that had been cut down by the early settlers got reestablished in those good years. Um, but unfortunately, we're probably going to see fewer of those good years from here on out. Thanks, Don. That was uh, a nice uh, encapsulation of the, the different real major habitats and some of the key risks, I think, that you're, you highlighted there with regard to as you move across that gradient from, uh, from the mountains to the river. Uh, I wanted to uh, give uh, Mark also a chance to respond, if he'd like to, in terms of any sort of climate issues that, you, that you're facing now um, or you know, ones that you consider the key vulnerabilities in the future. Sure, I, I think Kevin pointed out uh, sea level rise is our big issue here. And uh, um, we know historically, as he, as he mentioned, from a tide gauge that's on our southern boundary, since the mid 90s, the mean sea level has risen between 10 and 15 inches in that period of time. And, and one of the things we deal with here on a recurring regular basis is what we term nuisance coastal flooding. And this sea level rise combined with the tides or storm uh, activities, you know, hurricanes, even in different parts of the Gulf, will cause us to have tide lines at the dunes. So the entire beach is inundated. Uh, we had 38 instances last year where we had to physically remove campers from the beach and close the beach to public access. And regionally in this part of Texas, we had over 90 uh, coastal flood events last year. So the, the, the sea level rise impacts on the park are, are here and now and something as managers we're, we're actually dealing with uh, regularly. Um, another thing uh, that went to Kevin's key message number four, which is human health. and, and has an impact on the other park I managed on Palo Alto Battlefield in Brownsville is the fact that for the first time in, in, I don't know, probably ever, we have recorded cases of Zika from mosquitoes that have come and they're actually, they're not ones that have been brought in by travelers, they're actually transmissions of Zika to human beings in Texas. Uh, we also have dengue fever, uh, chikungunya and, um, you know, other mosquito-borne diseases that are a product of climate change as these mosquitoes are able to live and, 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 and uh, reproduce further north. So, you know, in both places, uh, sea level rise and changing species, uh, changing ecologies are, are part of our issues. Yeah, the human health, uh, we have that at Big Ben too. We had a heat fatality last month, uh, not uncommon at all. And uh, the drought I mentioned with the, the killing the trees, we've had to go in as a management issue and cut down the dead trees that are overhanging campsites in the high Chiso so we don't get tree fall on the tents with people on them. So it, it kind of, it, it cascades throughout our whole program. Right, and you lose that shade effect as well, so which is important <laughs> in, a, in a landscape like that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, is, is heat also an issue, Mark, um, for you uh, there at Padre yeah, Island? Absolutely. And... absolutely. We're in the middle of that same heat wave that's impacting Oklahoma at this point. I think Corpus Christi has been above normal for like about a 30-day run right now. And I, I would also make the point that even if you have a 95-degree day here, when you add the humidity that's so prevalent on the Gulf Coast, you know, we have many days where the heat index or the feels like index is 110, 115. Uh, you know, we, at this point in time, right now in the park, we're pairing our maintenance people together. So nobody's out by themselves working out of doors without a, a partner who could literally assist them if, if heat stroke or heat exhaustion was an issue. And our rangers are doing the preventative search and rescue, like you saw on Kevin's slide, the sign on the trail. Um, I think most of our trails have those signs to warn people, even up in the mountains where it's 20 degrees cooler than the desert. Yeah, yeah that is certainly a profound influence right now. And, and given Kevin's first slide, which showed the, a change in the number of 100 degree days um, out to the, out to the late, uh, out into the late century, that's 
uh, portends for a, you know that uh, that trend to continue in terms of a risk. And it sounds like you're already taking a lot of measures to educate folks on the the danger there, but um, it will that will continue to be a, a high risk, I, I assume, uh, based on you know the data that we're looking at so far. Um, I was wondering if if either you could speak to um, climate change coming into a discussion of any sort of key management decision that you're making. Um, this could be something like, you know, looking at a water supply or, um, you know, you were talking about uh, closures or that kind of thing. Yes, the, the water supply is, is the thing that popped into my mind when you mentioned that. Um, our management team is, is uh, adding capacity up in the in the high mountains and for our developed area that's up in those mountains as a way to survive the, the droughts because our water source reacts pretty quickly to changes. Uh, it's, it's not a big aquifer and it, uh, it, it runs out pretty fast. If we don't get a rain, we run out of water. So they're increasing capacity there. Um, we're tracking employee water use. Of course, we've been water aware for a long time uh, we've closed the wash rack. We don't wash government vehicles in the park anymore. Um, the for the river, uh, we have sort of thought about negotiating with the tex the Mexicans that control the dams. Our, most of the water in the, the Big Bend Reach comes from uh, from Mexico, um, and manage invasive species as well. And our new superintendent wants to to build more, uh, put in more solar panels in the park as a way kind of to that global thing, use less energy um, from, uh, you know, uh, hydrocarbon using power systems. Okay. I, just, I just want to add into that, you know, here at Padre, our management decisions really involve infrastructure. Uh, we're building literally on sand, um, but with sea level rise, you know, we get into large discussions about do you replace a visitor center, and it was particularly one that's vulnerable. We did an environmental assessment a few years ago to build a dune uh, restoration project in front of our visitor center and take a boardwalk up over it uh, to protect probably the largest and most valuable structure in the park from storm surge in the event of a hurricane. Unfortunately, we're not able to fund that project, so we have a gap in our dunes, which is a natural protection for that facility. Um, and the most expensive building sitting right in the middle of that gap. So uh, we have a lot of discussions right now about, you know, what is the appropriate uh, footprint on, on a park that arguably in, you know, two or three, four decades is going to be markedly different in terms of how much dry land we have. Yeah, well, that is certainly a key decision. Um, Given we've got about 15 minutes, I wanted to um, bring Michael into the discussion here a little bit as well. Um, and, and just before, before I do that, uh, one, one quick reminder for the audience, uh, feel free to submit questions uh, as we go here, and we will, uh, we will try to get to those as well as part of this discussion. Uh, but Michael, uh, you, given you know, that that's the, the, the audience question there, about half the folks on the, on the call know about the uh, Climate Adaptation Science Center, uh, the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. I was wondering if you could just describe a little bit, for those that don't know, about the mission of your organization and how, you know, give some specifics in terms of how it relates to the National Park Service. Okay. Can you throw up that first slide that I sent you off? The one with the, there we go. So the South Central Climate Science Center is located in Norman, Oklahoma. We're one of eight climate science centers nationwide. Um, we're an oddity among federal organizations in that we are co-governed. So um, I am on the federal side of um, our center. We also have what we call our consortium, which is a group of university and tribal organizations, which you can see listed there, as well as um, one federal lab. And um, they are our consortium. So I like to say that the... Um, the federal side brings the money and the consortium brings the uh, brains to the thing. Um, mostly what we do is we fund research. 
So I spend a good part of my year visiting with folks, both researchers and people who could potentially use the results of that research to understand what kinds of things they struggle with, um, what kinds of things related to climate um, would give them the information they need to make better decisions about the resources that they manage. Um, we have a, um, a stakeholder advisory group that provides us with input on those kinds of things um, as well. Um, we also serve as a boundary organization. So we take the information that researchers throughout the United States are um, developing regarding climate and climate impacts and how we can adapt to those impacts. And we bring that to the people who can make use of it. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, would you jump to the next slide? Okay, and then this is a specific example. Um, this is from a uh, work done by um, Mark Schmidt, I'm sorry, Jack Schmidt and Todd Blythe at University of Utah. And on the left side, you see what they um, estimate as the original flow of the Rio Grande. Of course, this is the northern part of the Rio Grande, all the way down to where the Rio Conchas comes in from Mexico. And the width of the blue line there, the width of the river represents the flow. And then on the right panel, you see the current flow, the, the non-historic flow. And you can see the dramatic difference. So this is work that we funded. Um, this kind of work is the kinds of things that we do. Um, we've been involved in a lot of other um, similar projects that I can list off but for the sake of time i prefer that we get to questions if that's okay with y'all but again the point of the climate science centers nationwide is to provide research to folks who manage natural resources and also cultural resources like the national park service sounds great thank you for that um do we have any questions at this time from the audience no nothing that's coming new um we still yeah uh, as a reminder, you can, if you don't want to type in your questions to the questions box, you can do your little hand raise icon and then I can selectively unmute you so you get a chance to just ask it verbally. So that is another option for questions, but nothing specific is coming yet. Okay. I thought we might take, the, take a moment here to ask the audience a question then, mm -hmm. keep them engaged. Um, question that relates to how often do you yeah. think about the impacts of climate change? Yeah, here's a question. I'm going to go ahead and launch it for you. This is another poll question where you can select one answer and then push submit. How often do you think about the impacts of climate change on the resources your park or office manages? So far, we've gotten about, almost half have voted so far. Um, we're a little over half now. Excellent. You guys are, are doing it faster than our last poll, actually. <laughs> They're getting the hang of this really quickly. We already have a higher response rate. Um, I'm about to close it in five, four, we're up over 80%. Three, two, one, close. I will share the results with the attendees. And then for the panelists, I will read this to you. Um, the number one selection was regularly uh, about 58% where number two was constantly at 31%, followed by rarely at 12%, and no one said never. Hmm. So about a third constantly, almost two thirds regularly, and then about 10% rarely. I guess if they're participating in this webinar, they're thinking about it right now. <laughs> we can't so say never, we can't exactly. Say never. Um, I'd, I'd also like to launch one more question about the primary barriers for land managers. Got it. Um, because I'd like to also put this question to, to uh, Don and Mark. Um, but uh, first, I, I thought, um, let's give it to the audience. So. Mm -hmm. You can do multiple choices. You can select as many that apply on this one. What are the primary barriers for land managers trying to adapt to climate change? Uh, the five options there for you, Dave, I had to condense them a little bit to sure. fit in the poll. <laughs> Limited info about the effects of climate change. Uh, limited info on how to respond to the effects. Maybe it's cost or capacity. Maybe belief the scale of the issue is beyond your control. 
or uncertainty about the risk that climate change poses. Um, so you can select any or all or none of those five. Right now we're at a 50% response rate, which I think is pretty good considering how long it takes just to read the question. <laughs> um, we're about two thirds, so I'm going to close it in another five seconds. Last chance to get your answers in. This is an interesting one. I'm excited. Close and share. Okay, so the attendees, you can see right away that the number one was cost or capacity constraints. 91% of people selected that as an option. There was one other option that was also greater than 50, and that was limited info on how to respond to climate change effects. That was 61% said that. And just below 50% is the belief that the scale is beyond a manager's control, 48%, followed by 35%. Limited info on the effects of climate change on key resources. And then finally, at 22%, uncertainty about the risk that climate change poses. So offhand, it seems like we feel like eh, not a lot of people are saying we don't have enough info about the effects or uncertainty. It's more a matter of how do we respond? Do we have the ability to respond? And is it even within our control to respond? Yeah, and I was hoping that uh, to either get a reaction or to put a similar question to, to, to the panel um, in terms of what's your experience, your own personal experience, if you were able to see that, uh, uh, the results from that, that question and the question itself, just in terms of uh, barriers for land management, for land managers to try and adapt to climate change? Well, I fully agree with the cost of capacity, but I would add another category, and that's because we've always done it that way. And um, right now, we're having a big discussion on a building replacement, and the A&E and the engineers and all these guys want to build a new building. And my response to that is, why build a building? Let's put in a portable structure we can move. Let's do something, if it gets wiped out by a tropical storm, we can replace for 10 cents on the dollar. But we've always built buildings. We've always had hard trails. We've always had nice campgrounds. So we have an education or a mind shift issue. Yeah. And it's, and it, I, yes, I agree. That's, I, I kind of agree with the, how things ranked out on the poll. Um, sometimes it's hard to know what you can do. Um, we do some things, uh, you know, managing our endangered species. For instance, we're starting a program to, to start a seed bank for an endangered grass species that only grows in the mountains. Um, so you do what you can. You try to restore grasslands uh, to what they were kind of before the Anglo uh, uh, ranchers overgrazed them. But that'll get harder with, with less rainfall and uh, more temperature extremes. Even what you are trying to do becomes more difficult. Larry just popped up. We must be getting close to the end here. <laughs> thank you for the thank you for those for those thoughtful answers. Um, how, how do you want to Dave, move on? Bust here, in here just a second. We had, we had just one question to pop in that I wanted to share with the group and have you respond. And I think it's a thoughtful question. As a manager, how do you balance spending time and money on restoration projects with the knowledge that the systems seem to be in the early stage of biome change? And Don's smiling, so he's got an answer. <laughs> no, I don't know. You know, I'm a geologist. I worry about deep time more. Um, and uh, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I, I think you, you do what you can. You slap the Band-Aids where you can. And you hope for the best, I suppose. You know, at Big Bend, we see that um, that Oak PJ uh, uh, woodland used to extend all the way down into the lowest elevations up until about 8,000 years ago. We had that Pleistocene woodland and kind of the natural climate change at the, at the end of the, at the ice age, they couldn't survive it. We, we know from pack rat middens. Um, and of course now things are accelerating so fast that uh, it's a very different story, but uh, you can just hang on and, and hope for the best, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, we have an endangered species program here with our sea turtles. We're aggressively trying to save this species by removing the nests from the beach, which are subject to predation and more importantly, inundation. And we can incubate these 
species in a laboratory situation and release them back into the environment. Um, but as climate change comes along, you know, we're going to have to re adjust our, our protocols for that as well. So it, it's, it's a moving target. It really is. Excellent. Michael, any thoughts on that question and the work that you do through the cask? I think it's a fascinating question. My background is social science. So um, I do not envy any of you who manage natural resources. This is a really <laughs> difficult time because not only are you wrestling with changes in the natural environment, but you've got a whole culture that has to change, a whole culture within the National Park Service and within the conservation community nationwide and worldwide that has to shift. And it's a struggle. It really is. And just in the last few years, I've seen some, the beginnings of some of that change among a lot of the um, folks that work with Fish and Wildlife and the folks that work with the National Park Service. We're, we're beginning to change how we think about preservation and restoration. It's tough. It's a tough situation. Um, we are, you know, we stand ready to help you all with anything that you need. Information, research, uh, consultation about climate change. We're here to help. I appreciate that. And it is really a fascinating question that borders on um, philosophy in many ways. And we're trying to turn a ship of conservation policy that has existed for 100 years predicated on an idea of stasis or balance and things are just moving directionally beyond anything we're familiar with. And so while we're mired in this sort of resistance mentality of resisting all change, uh, the discussions that we've been seeing here in the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service and beyond, certainly now we're being a lot more welcoming or accepting of this idea that in some cases it's appropriate to accept change or even in some cases direct change um, actively. And yeah, it's it's a fascinating realm that we're starting to dip a big toe in. We have unfortunately reached about the end of our time here. I just wanted to take a moment and thank all of our presenters and panelists on the screen, Kevin as well, who's still on the line with us. If participants, you'd like to continue the discussion, we encourage you to do so. We invite you to follow up with our presenters and our panelists as appropriate. They have all graciously um, um, allowed us to share our, their contact info with you, and we will do that in a subsequent follow-up email. We'd like to also extend our appreciation and sincere gratitude to uh, those who work behind the scenes that Kat mentioned earlier to bring events like these to you. As soon as we end this broadcast, a quick pop-up will appear requesting your response on a very brief survey. Please do take a moment to fill that out. Your responses help improve each one of these offerings going forward. And in the days ahead, you'll receive that follow-up email from me with links to the recorded webinar, contact information for all our presenters and panelists, and a few additional goodies to share with you. So thank you all very much for joining us for today's roundtable, and we'll relieve you with a reminder of the key takeaways from Kevin's presentation on the Southern Great Plains chapter of the NCA4. And as a reminder, we'll be holding additional roundtables for each of the remaining NCA4 regions, and we invite you to join those discussions as well. So with that, have a great day, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it.